Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Hey there, welcome into episode 65 of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. My guest on the show today is Elizabeth Danth. Elizabeth and I connected initially because of an article that she had written in ASCD that focused on imposter syndrome in school leadership. I reached out to her, we had a conversation, and then decided let's get on the podcast together and talk about all of these different topics that she's writing for ASCD about. So let me tell you about Elizabeth really quick. She is the Director of Professional Learning at Round Lake Area Schools, which is in the Chicago area. She has a master's and a bachelor's degree in English, and she has a master's degree in school improvement leadership. She's been in education for 13 years and, like many of us, had a circuitous route that brought her to this amazing profession that we all share. Elizabeth and I sat down and talked about that martyr mentality in education. We talked about professional development for all, meaning specifically personalized professional development. We talked about quiet quitting, and we talked about imposter syndrome. And you're going to hear all of that right on the other side of these messages. Hey leaders, how often do you hear from certain teachers that PD just doesn't feel relevant to them? If you need a professional development solution, that offers differentiated PD that will cater to the unique needs of your teachers, I've got the answer. Peer Driven PD seeks out some of the best teachers in the country, documents their tips and techniques that work in real classrooms every day, and provide that content directly to schools. That's right, your teachers can learn from other full-time classroom teachers that are in the trenches just like your staff. And the great thing is, Peer Driven PD features a wide range of material from all levels and content areas. This means instant credibility with some of your most reluctant educators. The courses are really engaging. Things like project-based learning at early elementary, building student agency with meaningful projects for secondary teachers, getting students unstuck in math, and so many more. And just released this fall, a series of classroom management essentials for early elementary, upper elementary, and secondary teachers, all taught by phenomenal full-time classroom teachers. Imagine the morale boost for your teachers when they see themselves and their day-to-day challenges reflected and addressed in their professional development. If you'd like to hear more, reach out to peerdrivenpd.com. Tell them the Leaning Into Leadership podcast sent you, and they'll give you a free trial access so you can check out all of their content and decide for yourself. Again, that's peerdrivenpd.com. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get on to the episode. All right, Elizabeth Damp, welcome into the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. You and I connected because of an article that I had read. I think I I I read it on LinkedIn uh, that you had written for ASCD around imposter syndrome and educational leadership. Really quick, for those who don't know who you are, just maybe give them a little rundown of, of your bio or you know something you think they should know about you. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been a school administrator for nine years. Um, before that, I was an English teacher and an instructional coach. And I sort of found myself in education, maybe in an unconventional way. Um, I graduated with two degrees in English literature right in the middle of the recession in uh, 2008, 2009. And uh, I I needed to have a plan B. So like every self-respecting millennial, I moved back in with my parents and got a practical degree in teaching. And that's how I ended up in education um, just a bit over 10 years ago. So I didn't spend too terribly long in the classroom. I, I went right to leadership. So that's that's interesting. You know, we we talk so often about, or at least I do. It's one of my favorite things to talk about when I'm when I'm in schools. Um, you know, when when I, especially like at the beginning of school years, you know, doing those those opening staff meeting, you know, types of uh, keynote speeches and that kind of thing to talk about people's origin stories. Um, you know, we make this assumption a lot of times with educators that you know everybody you know at the age of seven was playing school when they came home from school. When like ninety something percent of us, that's not true. So it's interesting to hear how how you made your path into education talk just maybe a little bit more about that yeah absolutely um i 
I was always good at school, but teaching was really never something that I saw myself doing, even though I had so many great teachers growing up um, that kind of showed me a, a good model, I guess, that I could have gone towards. Um, but I plan A was to be a university professor. So I was pursuing my PhD at the time. And then I, I sort of was looking around during the recession and watching people, you know, not even come close to getting any kind of job in that industry and, you know, people having to start all over at some terrifyingly old age, like 30. And I thought, well, I don't want that to be me. Um, well, you know how it is. You spend eight years doing a PhD and then all of a sudden you're 30 and you're still waiting tables. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I got into education. There was um, a university nearby that did an expedited one year degree plus the extra couple months for student teaching. So I, I went with that, honestly, because I thought I can't live with my parents forever. So I know that that's not a glamorous origin story. There's nothing no, terribly right. heroic, but um, it did it did give me sort of an interesting perspective when I came in to education through that door, because it really revealed a lot of the assumptions that people were making about why you became a teacher, being a teacher because it's it's a viable, respectable, middle-class profession where you're doing a valid service to society. That was never a, a reason. It was always, oh, you're here because you're so passionate and you always dreamed of being a teacher. And, you know, and then that and seemed to be the, the back on which a lot of asks of teachers were built was because you're, you're here because you love it, right? So automatically you must do this. And meanwhile, I'm working two jobs for the first couple years of teaching just to keep food on the table. So I didn't I didn't really have time for all of that. I didn't have this magical passion and sense of purpose that people were looking for. So I just felt like I wasn't the the jigsaw piece that they were shopping for, to be really honest. You know, I think that's really interesting because that mantra of, you know, education is a calling, um, while in many, many cases is is valid, but I think that's that's probably true in a lot of professions. But maybe it gets overused in education. Um, in fact, I know that it gets overused in education. I mean, many of us have that you know have that moment that we can say, "Oh, you know, hey, this is why." I mean, mine isn't glamorous either. Mine wasn't some you know oh magical calling into education. It was athletics that pulled me there. I got asked to help coach a basketball team and I was hooked. I wanted to be a coach and to be a coach, the best route to go was to go into education. Now, of course, once I was there, I fell in love with what I was doing, but it wasn't, yeah, I wasn't the guy, you know, at age seven who was lining up the action figures and playing, playing school when I got home from school. That absolutely wasn't happening. And I think there are more and more educators that are out there that have stories that are more similar to mine and more similar to yours than to the romanticized, you know, oh, I just always wanted to be a teacher with with the caveat here. Listeners, please understand me here. Nobody's saying that's bad. Nobody's saying that, you know, people who knew from the word go they wanted to be a teacher, that, that that's not a, a positive thing. In fact, it's an incredible thing, you know, good for them. Um, that was not my path, nor was it yours, Elizabeth, I guess is kind of where I'm going with that. Yeah, I think it's great if it is. But I think when you make the assumption, that's where things start to fall apart. Or when you say that because something is a calling to you or because you are passionate about it, that allows me to take advantage of your passion or for me to ask you to do things that are so much beyond the scope of the job is to be extortative. That's that's when it starts to fall apart. And I do think that we are so eager to make these assumptions about teachers because we, we want to keep piling on. Yeah, absolutely. So I was reading an article, uh, one of the ones that you had written recently, and it was talking about skill sets and support over sainthood. And I think this just dovetails perfectly into that particular article. And uh, I, I'm just going to mention something that I read in there that really hit me, you know, right where it needed to. And then have you talk a little bit more about what, what kind of was your purpose behind it. But you talk about what essentially is a martyr mentality or a need for us to build up this generation of teachers, this new generation of teachers to be more focused on the fact that they're professionals rather than they're just this group of selfless, you know, individuals following a calling. Uh, talk a little bit more about where where the core of that came from. 
a lot of it came from my experience as a teacher. Um, so I mentioned that when I was teaching, uh, I was not making enough really to have any savings, let alone do anything fun or, you know, it was just barely enough to make ends meet. So I had to work a second job and I worked a second job, an extra 20 to 30 hours a week, which meant that I couldn't be the teacher to stay late. The looks that I got when I rolled out of there at three, again, to be at my second job, which I needed, um, were, you would think I was this awful monster. And I think that we make a lot of assumptions that the best teachers are the ones who are there until midnight every night. They're the ones who take work home. They're the ones who are grading all weekend. They're the ones who dig deep into their pockets to make that beautiful classroom. Um, they're the ones who go so far above and beyond that they do things for kids that society maybe should be doing. Like, for example, bringing in extra food for kids who don't have enough to eat. Not that that isn't something that is great if you do it, but you shouldn't be expected to do these things. You shouldn't be expected to spend all of your extra money on your classroom decor. And frankly, good instruction does not hinge on clock time. You can be an excellent teacher and not be at school until midnight every single night. Um, you can be a great teacher and not take grading home. Um, so I, I think that these things are possible, but we just, we look so much at the other side. Oh, he must be a great teacher because he's, you know, there until all hours, or this person is a bad teacher because they're leaving early, when realistically, you don't know why they're leaving early. And this martyr mentality that we have, it does, I think it does come from the top down, because even now as an admin, you see it in the looks that people maybe give you if you step out of your office early, right? And the person who stays the latest is the most hardworking. And, it, you know, there's there's a lot of assumptions that we make about some of the non, and by non, I guess I mean the outside of professional behavior. Like what you're doing when you're not on the clock somehow determines how good you are when you are on the clock. So that's really what I meant by martyr mentality. And it's it's just such a common thing. You see it in parents, you see it in teachers, you see it in admin, it's, it's ubiquitous. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it it ties in really well with with what you kind of referred to as as your professional your professional proposal or kind of, you know, almost like looking at that Danielson framework, you know, and that really looks at, you know, more about the proficiencies as opposed to just this, you know, being selfless or or being a saint, uh, as you talked about in the article. Can can you talk a little bit more? Um for my listeners, I mean, I've, I've read the article and I will link the article in the um, in our show notes, but talk a little bit more about that, that, I guess that, you know, professional proposal that you would have for how we need to be looking at our teachers going forward. Yeah, um, teaching is a skill that can be learned and developed, which is great news for everybody. It's great news. So when you come in, uh, as you and I did, you know, from the perspective of someone who maybe wanted something else out of the profession and you're coming in and you're saying to yourself, I want to, I want to be a good teacher. You know, I don't, I don't know that this is my life's purpose necessarily or the extension of all of my hopes and dreams, but I want to be a good teacher. How do I do that? Because of things like the Danielson framework and the ever growing body of research on good instructional strategies, you can learn how to be a good teacher. And it isn't necessarily about how many hours you spend outside of school doing X, Y, or Z. Um, so take the Danielson, you look at it and it talks an awful lot about what your classroom environment should be like, your routines and procedures, the way that you respond to student misbehavior, your organizing of physical space. I mean, it's very broken down. So Danielson started to be implemented in my state in Illinois when I was teaching. I think it might've been implemented second, third year that I was in the classroom. And I actually really appreciated because it was a clear picture of to be a good teacher, this is what you have to do. And I know that there are many who will say, well, to get a good evaluation, this is what you have to do. But uh, but I disagree. I actually think that between the 26 or whatever indicators on that thing, it pretty mm -hmm. clearly paints a picture of this is what your grouping should look like. This is what your differentiation looks like. This is what the instructional strategies you're using are. Professionally, this is a description of how you should act in PLC, in professional development. This is what your planning should entail. And so you can go at that that document and find exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And just for me, it was it was cut to the chase, right? I don't have a ton of time. I want to be a good teacher just because I never saw it as my life's purpose didn't mean I didn't want a good eval or to be an effective teacher. I'm there. I may as well be good. I want to make sure the kids are learning, right? So cut right into that center of it and say, here's what I need to do to make this happen. 
I will group this way. I will try these strategies. I will plan this way. I will do this in PLC. And then you then you just do it. Like maybe I'm giving a reductive answer, but it didn't seem to me like there was a ton of, you know, mystery around it. It was right. it's a skill. Learn the skill, get better at the skills. Listen to what your admin tell you. Listen to what, you know, the teacher next door is telling you. Listen to what your coach tells you and just improve. Yeah, you know, as somebody who used the Danielson model for for evaluation for a number of years, everything okay? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. You you cut out sound wise for just okay. a minute, but now, then no I think you're you caught up just a little bit. So I saw you talking no and I didn't hear a thing. That's okay. Um, I'm going to write that time down, and then I know exactly where I was starting. I'll just start over. So at me okay and we'll go back in at 1330 so as somebody who used the danielson model for evaluation for a better part of a decade granted a little bit of a modified danielson model we had kind of done some things you know taken some liberties as a district with our evaluation tool but but the core of it was was the danielson model I found it interesting and, and often sometimes a challenge as both as an assistant principal and as a principal that so many of the things that we talk about when we talk about the great teachers, the things you talked about, you know, uh, you know, bringing in extra food, spit, you know, staying late, doing this, doing that, they don't show up on the model. I mean, there, there is, you know, like one rubric like you talked about, you know, with some professional behavior and professional expectations, but there's really nothing there around all of those other going above and beyond types of things. And like almost from, from the reverse perspective, not disagreeing with your perspective, but but just going back into my mindset as a principal sometimes, I, I struggled with, well, there's nothing in this that allows me to reward and reinforce that. And maybe that's a good thing. You know, perhaps that is a good thing to have that. Let me, I'll let you run with that a little bit. Yes, I think it is a good thing ultimately. But I also think that what you just described is actually the reason why many did not like the Danielson model when it came out, because they might have been in this very martyr mentality or this very like, but look at how how much extra I do, you know, look at all of the different uh, ways that I care about my students. And again, not saying that that's bad at all, but I think that when you're looking at the extra and you're defining good teaching as all of the peripheral things, but maybe a little bit less about clean instructional strategies and whether or not the kids actually learned, um, you know, that's where the disconnect comes in. It's, it's look at who I am, look at my soul, look at how my kids like me and not analyzing the actual instructional efficacy of what you're doing. Um, so I think a lot of people balked at it because it maybe was a, it seemed cut and dry or it seemed a little too clinical or it seemed a little bit detached from some of the emotionality of teaching. And again, there's sort of these common sense things, right? So if, if your students like you, you do have an easier time teaching them. That's obvious, right? If you can get kids to have fun in your classroom. I know it's not on the Danielson, but all of the things in the Danielson will be significantly easier if you're right. you're good at relationships and you're likable and you know they care about you as a person and you care about them as people. Like all of that is still good. It's just one of those too subjective and maybe a little bit too emotionally squidgy things to be on this Danielson framework, which descri is meant to describe the skills of teaching rather than the social emotional aspect. Yeah, I think that's uh, three things with that. It, number one, first time anybody's ever used the word squidgy um, on, on the podcast. So that's that's pretty outstanding. Um, there you go. Yeah, some bonus points for you. Good work. Um, and then um, two, yeah, straight from Rita Pearson's TED Talk, people don't learn from people they don't like. Um, obviously an important piece, still not necessarily going to fit onto the Danielson model. And then, and then the last thing is really that the Danielson model was birthed out of a time when No Child Left Behind was really beginning to rear its ugly head. And it really became, maybe this is the, the, the positive that comes out of that, but it really became about student outcomes. It wasn't just about feeling good about school. It was about are kids learning? Are we seeing improvement? Are we seeing growth? Are we seeing development? Or are we just having fun? So 
Yeah, I think you're right. I think a lot of people, in fact, I don't think I was a big fan originally of that Danielson model because, yeah, it didn't give me the latitude to say, you know, man, the kids really seem to be enjoying themselves. I mean, I guess I could write that in the comments, but that wasn't going to have anything to do with being anything from unsatisfactory to whatever the far right hand column was at that point in time, exceptional, whatever. Well, I wonder if maybe the, the timing of it plays a role, because like I said, the Danielson came out or was implemented as the eval framework, and I think it was my second year of teaching, and I loved it because like most teachers, I didn't feel like teacher preparation school prepared me to be a teacher. So yeah. there I am with 30 kids on day one, like the student teaching was not like this, you know, like teacher school doesn't really <laughs> yeah. prepare you. And so for me, it was, a, it was a little bit of a lifeline because I felt like it outlined some things that maybe hadn't been super clear before. Um, you know, but if, if I had had my own classroom for 10 years and I had been really solid in my ways and I knew that I was an effective educator and then all of a sudden this thing comes rolling in discounting a lot of the tried and true methods that I had found, I could see having a different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's, let's bounce that a little bit then into, um, from, from your classroom teacher role, then you went into being an instructional coach. So, so now maybe with a little bit different, different hat, um, one, just talk about that role, what that was like for you moving from classroom teacher into being an instructional coach. And then how did you see and, and maybe how did that shape your thinking around, you know, kind of this this model of what we should be doing to to prepare our next generation of teachers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I became a coach in my third year out of teacher school. So uh, as I say, I've been an administrator three times longer than a teacher or a coach. Um I it was it was a position that was created as part of a school improvement grant and so I was one of the first coaches in my school ever and we really didn't have any type of pre-existing format for what that looked like so a lot of it and this would have been 2013 so instructional coaching was just on the up and up um, as a concept not that it didn't exist before but this was right when a lot of schools in their efforts to get better student scores and comply with NCLB or have grants, you know, to, to reconfigure the schools were hiring coaches. So it was, it felt really nebulous as I stepped into that coaching role. And I, I had some other coaches. Um, I was a literacy coach. We also had a math coach and a second literacy coach. And together, we just spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the best use of our time was. Um, was it delivering PD? Was it doing observations? How to get people into coaching? Because that's always the hot topic, right? Should people be drafted into coaching? Should right. it be totally voluntary? You know, it's hard. And I, I was only a coach for one year. So full disclosure on that, too. Um, but what it made me want to do was be an administrator so that I had a little bit more influence and sway in some of the decision making. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, and that's in a lot of cases, that's a common pathway for for our classroom teachers to become administrators is to go through that instructional coaching route. Um, I've actually talked more and more with people who have actually followed that route in order to get to get into that into that position of the opportunity of, of being an administrator it was not a pathway that I followed. But I think, um, you know, what you're talking about there when that popularity of instructional coaching started to really come about was right around a time for me when I had already stepped into being an administrator. So it was a little bit late. But, you know, it's interesting that you say that, you know, as, as a team of coaches, you guys were struggling with, you know, what's the best use of our time? Because I know as an administrator, you know, I had at one point in time, I think I had five instructional coaches at my high school. Now, at 1,500 kids, 1,200 or not 1,200, I had 120 staff. And so, you know, that was designed to support all of them. But we struggled with that exact same thing. You know, is it only if people choose to be coached, um, only if people are on an improvement plan, or, you know, when do you really, you know, when do you really push for somebody to have a coach? Because now as somebody who's coaches leaders, I believe everybody can benefit from a coach. It's not just about one person or another. So how, how ultimately did you solve that? What, and again, I know it was only one year, but how did you guys ultimately go about identifying who was receiving coaching? We ultimately went for the teachers who wanted 
the coaching received a little bit more coaching. Um, our logic being that trying to force things on people wouldn't actually lead to instructional change. And that's a principle that we also see with professional learning. And, you know, I, I run the PD for my district and we see across the board that choice and teacher choice and agency is one of the two probably most important things for true professional growth. So using a, a threat-based system or forcing people into something when they don't have any say in it or don't want it, that's if, if your goal is to improve instruction, that's not the way to go about it. It's, it's a great way of, I don't know, covering your butt to prove that you did something, <laughs> right? right? Like I tried to help him, I gave him a coach and you know he didn't yep. learn anything. Um, so yeah, the, the choice and, and trying to work with teachers who wanted the additional help because then they could maybe be some of the change agents, right? So you start with the willing participants and then they'll eventually snowball and eventually more and more people will hear the good word. Um, that's a, a common enough change model and that's, that's the one that we went with. Hey leaders, let me tell you a story. It's the story of my first year as a high school principal. I will tell you, I was exhausted, I was overwhelmed, and I lived my life breathing through a snorkel because my head was so far underwater and I didn't think there was a way out. I mean, I was a mess. The 40 feet that it was to move from my assistant principal office down to the principal's office might as well have been a 400 mile trek. I was just absolutely putting in crazy hours. I was trying to do it all, like trying to answer everybody's question, thinking I always had to be the smartest one in the room and I had to solve everybody's problems. We're talking severe super head syndrome here, folks. Every day was fire after fire, and all I accomplished was putting out fires. Forget about leading, I was simply trying to survive. Now, after working with a leadership coach, I really was able to get things figured out, get my head from being a firefighter to actually being a leader. But it took work, and I discovered some things that really mattered. And that's why I've created Walk in Your Purpose, five mindsets to level up your leadership, a free ebook that you can have today at no cost. Just go to walkinyourpurpose.roadtoawesome.net backslash ebook to download your free copy. Again, that's walkinyourpurpose.roadtoawesome.net backslash ebook. It's time for you to walk in your purpose, to find joy in your job, and to be the leader you always knew that you could be. You talk about having people who are going to, um, you know, benefit are going to be the ones who really want to buy it. And you talk about the work you do in leading professional development or, or you know, putting together professional development in your district. What are some strategies that you're using right now in your role to really encourage or to help increase the buy-in in people being a part of taking on professional development and professional learning? We're very fortunate in that our district devotes a ton of time and resources to PD, and we are at a point where we want and choose to provide almost all of our PD in-house, meaning the experts who work here in my school district are the providers of PD. And they're a combination of our specialists, our administrators, our division chairs. We have a wide range of PD facilitators. And what we do is we allow people mostly to pick what and how they learn. So when I say how, I mean that we have all these different structures of PD. There's large traditional workshops, there's small action research groups, um, there's small coaching crews where people receive sort of group coaching based around common goals. Of course, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching, we have a badging system, we have online PD and live PD. And so when people think about how they learn best, what works best for me, I need the one-on-one -on -one feedback, or I like to work with a group so there's not so much attention on me, or I like the action research because I get to pick exactly what I study. Um, I like online. I like live. That how piece really means a lot to teachers. And of course, we offer PD in a ton of different topics. So, you know, we have 
kind of like a college catalog. It's like a semesterly catalog of all these different options. And then people, they do have to pick a certain number. So if we offer mm -hmm. three periods worth of PD on every single monthly PD day, then they have to pick two. Um, right, but they get to pick what the two are. And there's so much diversity in terms of what's available to them. So that has gotten the buy-in pretty well. And I will say we are at the point where, shoot, four or five years ago, I had to beg people to sign up for anything, even though it was required, even though they had to sign up, I still had to beg them to yeah. sign up. And then I had to go through all the, re oh my gosh, we have 200 people who didn't sign up. Now it's like the Hunger Games. We hit registration goes <laughs> live at let's just say 1 a.m. or 1 p.m. People are on there. We crashed our system last month when registration went live for Spring PD. It was actually oh, really wow. horrifying um, because so many people wanted to get their first choice. And they, you know, were very angry if they don't get into their first, second choice session. And they knew which ones they wanted. And they had spent the entire previous day marking up the catalog and picking what they wanted. You know, and then now they... Now we have the opposite problem of apathy where people care so much. And so we have to figure out uh, how to, I don't know, how to fairly, I guess, get everyone the courses they want without, I don't know, breaking our registration system. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So how did you go about identifying or what's the process for, you know, each semester, each year, putting the professional development in place? I mean, how are you identifying what what it is that people need. I mean, and clearly you're doing it in a way that's very effective because they're breaking the system trying to get in there. We actually do this by academic departments. So we have a district math team, English team, science team, special education team, and all of that. What they do is uh, in the middle of the previous semester, they put their ca their mini catalog together. So math is going to run these sessions and English is going to run these sessions and science and so on. Um, and I encourage each department to do a mix of types. So maybe you do one coaching crew and one action research group and three workshops and have a coach on there. And then I mash them all together and I send it forward. Now they base what they choose to give PD on, on what they're seeing in classrooms. So one of our po most important sources of data is walkthroughs. Um, and we have massive quantities of people who do walkthroughs. It's not just administrators, you know, it's also our specialists who are kind of like coaches. Um, and all of these, these people doing walkthroughs, they're looking at what they see in classrooms. They might be in 10, 20 classrooms a week. And then they're saying with their team, all right, you know, what are the science strategies that we think our teachers have used and have embedded really well? And what do we think they need some work on? And then that determines the subjects, I guess, of the workshops and the, and the teams that they're going to put in the catalog. Um, so walkthrough data and then sometimes student achievement data as well, just based on what we're seeing in terms of student learning, that will tell us where we need a little bit more support. Um, so in particular, when we think about how to best serve students with IEPs, how to serve our language learners, we will often dig into that student data and then use that to sort of backwards plan our PD. That's awesome. I love that. You know, that's, I think that's what we want to see, you know, our teachers doing is using a lot of different data points to identify what it is our kids need. And if we can model that uh, as district level leaders through, you know, personalized professional development for teachers like you're doing. I think that's really, really powerful. I want to jump now uh, a little bit in, in a bit of a different direction. And that's the article that you wrote that talked about quiet quitting. And and maybe maybe for our listeners who don't quite understand what, what quiet quitting is, can you talk a little bit about that and where, um, where you were going with that particular article? I, I found it really fascinating. I have seen so many think pieces on quiet quitting just all over the internet, basically for the last year, I would say it really was the theme of 2022 um, for me in terms of you would, not just in education, but across all industries, you would see um, think pieces on workers doing the minimum requirement at work, right? They would do their job as listed in the job description, but they would decline to stay late or hustle for extra projects to try and get ahead. Um, you know, they didn't feel like their job was their sole source of identity anymore. Um, essentially, they would build a bit more of a firm barrier between their work life and mm -hmm. their home life uh, so that they could prioritize being at home a little bit more. And many people have said, well, this is a natural outpouring of the pandemic, which revealed just how quickly your company will lay you off. Um, 
in in a moment, really, if it seems like the money isn't going to work out for them, you're gone. And a lot of people have thought, well, it is logical that a worker who got laid off or who had a hard time making ends meet during the pandemic would stop putting their hope in work and stop putting their hope in a company or some sort of organization or industry to be this, I guess, uh, pillar of their life. Um, and so quiet quitting, yeah, I think is is treating, it's a pejorative term for building that work-life boundary and not trying to outshine at every minute of every single day at work. And in an educational context, I think this we see this come up as teachers are essentially a little bit more confident expressing discontent with working conditions when they're saying, look, I stayed up until 3 a.m. every single day during work from home. Um, all of March of 2020, April of 2020, there I was scrambling and doing everything I could to reach out to kids. And, you know, we were expected to go so far above and beyond and it was just not sustainable and I'm not doing it anymore. And I think it, it definitely connects to teacher burnout. I think it connects to the turnover that is ransacking education right now. Um, I think it connects to teacher attitudes and their willingness to say, we just want certain better conditions. We, we just do. We need whatever it is, more societal support, more resources, more public respect, more money, more benefits. It, it's coming from a place of because you're asking so much more than what, right. what you're willing to give. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's been that way for so long. And I think just as you said, you know, in a lot of ways, the the effects of the pandemic really kind of just pulled the wool back a little bit more. And now we have had a lot more and appropriately so stress on putting those boundaries in place. And, you know, the myth of work work life balance, you know, it, it's hard to have a balance, really, but but to to focus on you know, hey, I have a life outside of my work as an educator. One, it ties back into what you talked about earlier in the show about, you know, really focusing on skills and the profession as opposed to, you know, just being a saint. Um, and really now with quiet quitting, if if, if that's the, the term we use for it, it's people are saying, look, you know, I've got some edges, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you. I think it's good that we have educators now who are willing to say and to stand up to, look, I need this. I need this. I need this. What, whatever those those things might be, whether it is benefits or time or, or or pay or additional time off or whatever the case may be. You know, we're we're well past a point in time where our profession needs to shift. And it needs to make some changes. And it isn't just in terms of how things are delivered in the classroom, but also in terms of how our employees are viewed and how they're supported. So were there some recommendations that you have uh, maybe maybe for leaders that are out there now who are seeing this? Is, is this something that they should be having conversations with their staff and maybe even like supporting them for for doing what they're doing is it something that they stay away from i mean what are the recommendations you have for for school leaders who are seeing this well i think the first thing is to see the positive because adults who are well adjusted and happy and feel like they have that work life balance are going to feel more comfortable and just generally be nicer in the classroom you know they're going to probably end up doing a more effective job because they're not constantly burnt out and stressed and angry all the time. Um, so I think that's a feature too, right? If you can make people not feel burning anger and resentment, it's it's better overall. So I think seeing that as a positive. Um, the second recommendation is to just be clear about what the actual expectations are. And for most school districts, this is actually laid out somewhere in a, in a contract. And so like I'm thinking about my district, we have a very long CBA, collective bargaining agreement, and it states what the expectation is, right? It states things like contractual hours. And so I think for the reflective leader, someone who is super clear about expectations, whether they're grounded in a contract or whether it's something like, hey, here's the expected turnaround time for responding to a parent. And then if people are meeting those expectations, they're meeting those expectations. If they're not exceeding it, they're still meeting, right? That's the thing is that maybe we have this mentality of expecting people to go so far above and beyond, but that's just not the milieu that we're working in. So lean into what we have right now, right? Like deal 
I, I guess I say deal as though this is a problem when I truly don't think it is. So embrace embrace the potential benefits of work-life balance. Be clear about what the expectations are and don't feel upset if people only meet them, but don't don't totally overachieve. And then finally, as a leader, finding some good boundaries for yourself. Because when I see leaders who themselves don't set good boundaries, the interesting thing is I actually think that they end up being less effective as leaders. When, when I see people who turn into martyrs for their job, when I see people who a work email comes in on their phone and they have the pop-up notification and they immediately respond, that's not healthy. It, it just isn't. So if, as someone who wants to be a good leader myself, I've learned to set some reasonable boundaries between my work life and my home life. And I do think it makes me more grounded and more confident and more engaged when I'm at work. So let's let's talk just a little bit more about that school leadership piece. Um, this was honestly the reason that, that I had originally reached out to you and really wanted to have you here on the podcast. Um, you wrote an article that talked about that imposter syndrome in leadership. You talked about the positional authority that you have in your job, but that there are those times when, you know, kind of that doubt creeps into your mind and you wonder about decisions that you're making or the impact of those decisions. Talk a little bit about that and and how how you see that not only in yourself, but maybe in other leaders around you. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating that um, we <laughs> we all know that teacher school doesn't prepare you to become a teacher as well as classroom experience. And the same is true of whatever educational leadership program you attended. It, it doesn't prepare you to be an administrator. Um, but we collectively, educators, teachers, admins, sometimes think it does, right? Like you got your leadership license, so you have spawned as the perfect administrator. And that's just not true. And uh, unfortunately, the process of learning to be a good leader is usually painful because it involves you making a bunch of mistakes and then reflecting on the mistakes and then saying, I'm not going to make these mistakes again. Um, and yeah. There are so many moments, though, that you can never know whether you made a mistake or not because you might not be getting the feedback. Maybe people are afraid of you and are not telling you. Um, maybe they think you won't listen. Maybe nothing they say would make a difference anyway. You won't see the results of what you've sown for years. Uh, maybe you're trying a new initiative and it's based on research and you think it's going to work but again you're waiting years down the road and you're relying on perfect implementation from your staff and they might or might not be doing that right and then the students might have their own thing going on and that could mess up whether or not the plan actually works so there are just so many moments that you simply can't prepare for and that you find yourself in the heat of these moments thinking i don't know what the right answer is so many things are just not simple and mm -hmm. so many things have to do with, I guess, human fallibility, right? As a leader, you still have a temper. You know you shouldn't show your temper to staff, but sometimes your buttons get pushed. Sometimes a staff member's buttons get pushed, and you might still be calm, but you're sitting there being screamed at thinking, what on earth did I do and what on earth should I do? And they're about to stop <laughs> yelling. What will I say yeah. when they stop yelling? Um, and experience <laughs> teaches you some of these things, yeah. but have it, I mean having been in leadership for a long time, I still find myself in moments that I couldn't have prepared for in a million years where there isn't a clear right answer. And you just have to find the, the leadership technique that works for you because what works for him maybe doesn't work for you and wouldn't work for the next guy. And it's, that's why they say it's really an art because your personality, the yeah. personality of the other people, the situation, proper leadership theory, all of these things make a cocktail of what is correct, but you don't usually get to, to see that completed until years later when you reflect right. on what you should have done. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a big part of why leadership coaching is so valuable too, because to have that person that you can share, you know, either, you know, whether they're there in the moment or you can share after the fact, you know, what, what has happened to have the kind of that third point perspective, very much like having an instructional coach in a classroom, you know, that can help kind of guide you along, you know, really is a benefit because sometimes, yeah, you just need to play it back through in your head and, and maybe you need to just play it back out loud with somebody else to be kind of like a sounding board um, to maybe give you a little bit of feedback. I also think too, that, we have those moments. You're absolutely right, Elizabeth. We have those moments where 
there's no clear answer right in front of us. And we're going to make a decision, whether that's a behavioral decision, whether that's something we're going to say, whether that's a, a call we're going to make related to our school or, or something like that. And to me, that's where it's so important for us to lean on those values that we hold, those beliefs that we hold within ourselves, the, the values and the mission that we have for our school. And if we believe in those and we really carry those, those carefully, odds are we're going to make a good decision in that situation. But you're right. You never really will know until somewhere down the road or, or you may never actually know did you make a high quality decision in that particular instance? Because you're you're right. You gave so many different reasons why a lot of times we don't get the feedback that we probably should get. It just it's a real challenge. And and I think that's why that article just really resonated with me. And there is a uh, I think when you get to a certain, I guess, rung on the ladder of leadership, you also don't get the feedback coming down from your supervisor because there's a certain assumption that, oh, well, once you're a coordinator or a director or a superintendent, you don't need the feedback. So you can just self-sustain and then your only form of growth really is reflecting and maybe if you have a trusting relationship with the people you supervise, they can give you some feedback. Um, but yeah, the lack of feedback really is tough. You usually yeah. only find out, <laughs> you know, if something went wrong, you tend to know, but if something went right, it could be crickets. Right. Absolutely. You know, I, I found that as a superintendent, um, you know, yeah, the, the next rung is my school board and, you know, none, none of my school board members had been educators. So it was really difficult to get, you know, feedback other than, you know, hey, here's what people in the community are thinking or, you know, that type of thing, which which that's fine. You want that feedback. But sometimes there, there maybe is, you know, some some technical or some, you know, some leadership theory types of things. And people who don't have that schema, it's really hard for them to give you that feedback. And that was one of the biggest struggles that I had. I I was real fortunate. I had some other uh, superintendents, you know, within kind of my my friend group, my peer group, if you will, that I could get that feedback from. But that was you're you're absolutely right. The further up that that ladder that you go, the more difficult it is to get really good quality feedback from people. Well, and probably the bread and butter of what you did as a superintendent wasn't what the board would see, right? They're not watching you run a meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not watching your every interaction with an angry parent. Um, They just assume that you can do these things. And yet, if you've been in that situation for so long that maybe you've gotten a little stale or you don't realize that something is going on, that, that might be the kind of feedback that you would actually value. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, This is such a fantastic conversation. Uh, Let's go ahead and jump to the final question that I ask everybody here on the podcast. Um, Elizabeth, you've shared already so many, so many things that you're doing from from the position that you hold. But let's let's just go one step further and tell me something else maybe that you're doing to lean into leadership right now. Yeah, um, it actually connects to what we were previously talking about. So the thing that I am doing is to be as reflective as I can every single day. Um, And what I mean by that is to look at like when a problem is brought to my attention, which happens every day, um, to try and reflect on it in a serious way. Like, is this a systemic thing that I have the power to change? Is this a me thing? Um, Sometimes it is a me thing. Is it a them thing? But that practice of reflecting when something happens or, you know, there's an opportunity for improvement rather than rolling my eyes, you know, saying a word, uh, right? Like rather than doing any of those exasperated behaviors, instead stepping back and asking myself a question, that is what I am trying to do to be a better leader because those moments of reflection are really what generates growth. Love it. That's absolutely outstanding. So Elizabeth, how can uh, the listeners get in touch with you if they want to hear more or want to talk to you some more, maybe want to reach out and get connected with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, I am on uh, Twitter as well as Instagram. Um, I think you're going to have my handle somewhere in the site, but it's Elizabeth Damfon. I'll be in the show notes. Yeah, it's just my name, Elizabeth Damfon, both of those. Um, And also my professional email, edamf at rlas-116.org. I will respond to your email. I'd love to. Absolutely. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Darren. 
Really appreciate that conversation with Elizabeth here on the podcast. Each of the articles that she and I talked about are linked in the show notes. In fact, her entire portfolio for ASCD is linked in the show notes. Make sure you check that out. And now it's time for a pep talk. Folks, it's absolute madness. It is March madness. And if you've been paying attention to the tournament, you know upsets are everywhere. But March Madness isn't just about basketball. As a school administrator, March Madness, to me, meant so many things that you have to get accomplished. So let me give you a few tips just to help you navigate your way through March Madness as a school leader. Number one, eat well. I got stuck so often going to or coming back from meetings, and that meant I would be stopping to grab fast food or gas station food or something like that. Or if I'm on duty, that means I'm in the hallway and I'm eating standing up, maybe only a granola bar and a Diet Coke. Folks, you got to feed yourself well, take care of yourself, have a salad every now and again, right? The greasy burgers and fries are good, but we can't make them our primary diet. Number two, feed your mind, right? When you're busy, when you're really busy, sometimes you tend to forget about prioritizing your own professional reading. Keep yourself sharp. You have to do that. Maybe that means starting to listen to books on your phone or on your computer. Maybe that means you keep your Kindle or your iPad nearby. So if you've got five quick minutes, do a little bit of reading, but you got to feed your mind. Number three, and this is a challenge, folks, especially this time of year, but go to bed early. Get yourself some sleep. You need good sleep. You can't be sharp if you're not sleeping, so make sure you get to uh, get to bed early. Feed your body. Take care of yourself. All right. Maybe that means you're going to the gym. Maybe that means you're getting out for a walk or you're on the treadmill. You're doing some yoga or, or something like that that allows you to take care of your body. Make sure you do that. It feeds in really well with number one, which is eating right, right? Because otherwise you end up like me, at one point, a couple of years into my principalship, out of nowhere, and it wasn't out of nowhere, I think I was 25 or 30 pounds heavier than I had been. And it's because I ate poorly and I wasn't prioritizing taking care of my body. And number five, lean into a thought partner. We all need to have that person that will pick up the phone or that we can pick up the phone and call just to work through some things. It can be lonely in leadership, but only if we allow it to. Make sure that you lean into those people. So there you go. Five quick things that you can do to help get yourself through March Madness. Thank you so much for joining me here on the show. Get out there and have a road to awesome week. Thank you for listening to the Leaning into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.